Thank you. That was a great intro. <laughs> Hello, thank you. Can everybody hear me? All right, great, because I have been losing my voice talking to all of you jerks all night at the bar every night. Uh, so I apologize if I'm a little less loud than usual. Um, thank you so much for having me back to Skepticon. This is my favorite conference of the year, every year, because you guys are so awesome. Yeah, give yourselves a round of applause. There is, uh, there's one thing I want to correct before I get started. I was looking at the, uh, the schedule that you all got, and there is a typo uh, on my name. Um, this, is, this is how my name is printed, and, and uh, that's a typo. Uh, there shouldn't be an apostrophe there. My middle name is just Fing. <laughs> so if you could just get that right in the future, Skepticon, that would be great. <laughs> So I know what you're all thinking, what the hell are you going to talk about? Because uh, I didn't tell anyone, so that's not on the schedule, I apologize. Uh, I'm going to talk about the scientific fact that girls evolve to shop. Facts. I know that this is a scientific fact because... Because... This is a science story that has appeared in the science section of major newspapers around the world, not once, but several times. Uh, here's the first time I noticed it. This was in February 2009. Uh, this article describes a study done by Dr. David Holmes of Manchester Metropolitan University, who said that women love to shop because, and I quote, skills that were learned as cavemen and women were now being used in shops. Gatherers sifted the useful from things that offered them no sustenance, warmth, or comfort with a skill that would eventually lead to comfortable shopping malls and credit cards. In our evolutionary past, we gathered in caves with fires at the entrance. We repeat this in warm shopping centers where we can flit from store to store without braving the icy winds. Now, I'm no scientist. <laughs> like Dr. Holmes, but I found a few problems with his line of reasoning. Uh, for instance, you don't generally uh, genetically inherit traits that are learned behaviors. Uh, for instance, uh, my father is very good at playing the drums. I cannot play the drums. It's weird that I wasn't born playing the drums. Also, if I inherited the useful ability to sift things I need from things I do not need while shopping, then why do I own a fire-breathing nun wind-up toy? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Available at skepticalrobot.com, FYI. <laughs> Number three, you don't gather in the cave. If you only gather in the cave, all you eat is like stalactite mushroom soup. <laughs> you have to leave the cave to gather things. So if we actually inherited that learned behavior of leaving the cave to shop, this is what our shopping malls would look like. <laughs> I'm a skilled artist, so I don't even have to explain what this picture is. <laughs> but I will for those in the back. <laughs> These are bushes, there's snow on the ground, and there are useful items sprinkled throughout the bushes like berries <laughs> for us to gather. <laughs> Problem number four, if women have been the ones who are most interested in fashion since the Pleistocene, uh, was King Louis XIV just some fabulous outlier? <laughs> questions, questions. In the end, though, it doesn't really matter because this isn't actually science. Surprise! Uh, the end of the article did helpfully explain the study was commissioned by Manchester Arndale Shopping Center in response to a rise in January visitors. All of the best studies, I think, are commissioned by shopping centers. So no, this is actually marketing 
disguised as science, which is a trend that's becoming more and more popular as mainstream news outlets phase out any and all support for actual journalists who study actual science. Uh, so here's how it works. Uh, what happens is that a client will come up with an idea. Uh, for instance, let's say it's an ice cream company that has decided that they would like to scientifically prove that ice cream uh, increases a person's total happiness much more than, say, sloths or puppies uh, or flowers. Which is, this is obviously untrue because nothing increases a person's happiness more than sloths. That's <laughs> obviously. Shout out to my sloth fans in the audience. <laughs> so, because it's not true, how are they going to get this into the media? Well, all they have to do is find a scientist who wants to earn a few hundred dollars. Anyone with a PhD will do. And they get them to run a half-assed survey. Uh, and then they give them a few quotes. The company makes up a press release. They turn it over to the newspapers. And the newspapers print the press releases pretty much verbatim. It's like magic. Uh, or science. Ben Goldacre uh, exposed this trick a few years ago. He published an email he got from a PR company that read, we are conducting a survey into the celebrity top 10 sexiest walks for my client Veet hair removal. And we would like to back up our survey with an equation from an expert to work out which celebrity has the sexiest walk with theory behind it. We would like help from a doctor of psychology or someone similar who can come up with equations to back up our findings, as we feel that having an expert comment on and an equation will give the story more weight. <laughs> they were offering 500 pounds, and uh, the rep said, we haven't conducted the survey yet, but we know what results we want to achieve. <laughs> We want Beyonce to come out on top, followed by other celebrities with curvy legs like J-Lo and Kylie, celebrities like Kate Moss and Amy Winehouse to be at the bottom, e.g. skinny and pale and shapely legs are not as sexy. I will find out when we will have the results of the survey for you. Are you pretty free this month? So you might think like no scientist would, fa would fall for this. No science with any, any ounce of morality <laughs> would fall for this, and you're probably right, uh, but somebody did. Uh, <laughs> Because as you can see, just a few months later, this uh, story appeared in the Telegraph. Uh, it was that a, a study, a scientific study, found that Jessica Alba has the perfect sexiest wiggle. Uh, <laughs> and the, the, the scientist that they ended up quoting was angry because they attributed his research to a whole team at Cambridge, and uh, apparently they, they they just ignored who he said actually had the sexiest wiggle and they chose Jessica Alba. So, yeah, I don't think he really had much right to complain, but... Uh, however, it's not just the marketers who are coming up with the bad science like this. And, in fact, um, researchers of, at Chicago, sorry, University of Chicago, um, came up with a study that also, uh, also supported the same theory, that women evolved to shop. Uh, the scientific theory. And I'm using scientific theory in the same way that creationists use scientific theory, <laughs> which is not a scientific theory. Um, yeah, because just 10 months after the faux scientific mall ad, the mainstream media was once again uh, awash in news that women evolved to shop, but this time the research in question was performed by evolutionary psychologists. So briefly, let me tell you what evolutionary psychology is all about. It's a field of study that's based on the belief that uh, the human brain as it exists today evolved completely during the Pleistocene era uh, when humans lived as hunter-gatherers. And for many pop evolutionary psychologists, this means that there is one overall human nature uh, that transcends any culture. So we can explain many of our behaviors that we see today by looking at what our ancient ancestors uh, were up to. Uh, so that seems like it has the veneer of science. I mean, it's got the word evolution in it. Uh, and by the way, I really wanted to talk about this here because I figure if you're going to come to the Bible Belt and bash something, it should be something with evolution in the title, right? <laughs> You're all, maybe the, if those protesters wander in, they'll be like, all right, this lady's speaking our language. <laughs> so uh, in this case, the evolutionary psychologist came up with this idea that women evolved to shop, not because caves are warm like shopping malls, uh, but because Pleistocene men were hunters 
and women were gatherers, and visiting museums is like hunting, and shopping is like gathering. Now, you, should I back it up? It's very complex. <laughs> it's very complex. I've mapped it out. Um, so back in the day, men were hunters and women were gatherers, and now men like museums while women prefer shopping. And this, the researcher in question noticed this on a trip to Prague. Uh, <laughs> he went with some friends and all of the men in the group wanted to go see cultural attractions and all the women wanted to go shopping. And he was like, what? Uh, <laughs> so, so he has determined that visiting museums is just like, sh like hunting and shopping is just like gathering, ergo science. <laughs> So I have a few issues with this. <laughs> uh, so, you know, one of his points is shopping is like gathering and seeing cultural attractions is like hunting, which makes zero sense considering his own quote in the article where he says about the women, when they came back with all the purchases, it was almost like a conquest, an expedition. They wanted to show us all the wonderful things they had found. That kind of sounds more like a hunt to me, an expedition. <laughs> That sounds like hunting, and also we use things like terms like bargain hunting, you know, and things like that. That sounds like hunting. Uh, while visiting museums is kind of slow, slow paced, you know, and it, that seems like it might be more gathered. So I kind of feel like maybe uh, he just picked which one he wanted to be hunting and which one he wanted to be gathering. I don't know. Uh, another thing he argues is that uh, shopping and gathering are the same because they're both social events. Uh, as we know, uh, visiting museums is not at all social. You're not allowed to talk to anyone. Um, and of course, we know that men in general hate being social. Um, most of you here can even hardly stand to just sit there next to all these people. So yeah, I get it. Uh, another one of his points is that you can bring children gathering just like you can bring children shopping. And I'm like, have you ever tried to go shopping with a child? <laughs> like, which would you rather do with a child? Go shopping or go to the science museum? <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, you didn't, need, it was, you didn't need to answer, but I appreciate. <laughs> I appreciate that you came to the same conclusion that I came to, <laughs> which is that this is utter bullshit. Um, the biggest problems with the study, though, are the same problems that are leveled against evolutionary psychology as a whole. Uh, I'll go over a few of those points. Um, for starters, while the brain is a product of evolution, that's not in question, the brain is also highly adaptable. Uh, evolutionary psychology requires that our brains evolved 12,000 to 1 million years ago and haven't changed since, which doesn't actually fit in with what we understand about evolution. We're not finished evolving. Uh, and in fact, just in the last 12,000 years, we've seen some interesting changes in human genes, like, for instance, evolving the ability to drink other animals' milk uh, in some regions. That's something that's happened relatively recently. Uh, but according to the evolutionary psychologists, uh, the brain stopped evolving. Uh, so another problem is that evolutionary psychology theories tend to be unfalsifiable. A lot of times they'll say, this stuff is, these behaviors are written into our genes but they never actually tell us which genes. <laughs> There's no evidence to support it. Uh, and also, we just don't know what our Pleistocene ancestors were up to. Uh, it's, it's shocking, actually, how little we know about our ancestors. We have some guesses, but uh, the two million years that made up that era were incredibly varied in terms of climate and in terms of environment, and most likely the lives led by our Pleistocene ancestors were just as varied. Uh, we don't know much about the family structure, we don't know much about the culture, and a lot of what we assume about them is actually taken from present-day hunter-gatherer cultures, which vary wildly from the Inuit to Australian Aborigines, uh, and even behaviors amongst groups that are geographically close can be incredibly varied. Uh, for instance, there are some contemporary African cultures in which men are the primary gatherers, not women. And scientists have found that amongst the Aita people of the Philippines, 85% uh, of women hunt the same quarry as men. And uh, the groups where men and women hunt together tend to be much more successful than when the groups are gender segregated. Uh, also, recent research by anthropologist Stephen Kuhn suggests that there was no sexual division of labor prior to the Upper Paleolithic. 
So these examples seem to be completely ignored when evolutionary psychology proponents use present day groups as these proxies for what our ancient ancestors were getting up to. Probably because these facts don't fit into the story that they're trying to build. There are a lot of uh, researchers who even argue that contemporary hunter-gatherers have been so influenced by agrarian culture that they have absolutely no relevance to what was happening in the Pleistocene. So the basic fact of the matter is we don't even know what they were getting up to. Uh, this is why there are tons of people who, particularly scientists, who think that a lot of the pop evolutionary psychology is just nothing more than just so stories, as Stephen Jay Gould noted. And the, ac the accusation that they make is that evolutionary psychology researchers uh, first identify a behavior like shopping. Uh, they assume that it has, it's evolved in response to environmental pressures. They don't need evidence for that. Uh, and then they find anything in our ancient past that might be relevant to that. So to give you an example, uh, let's take a behavior like the fact that men prefer blondes. Uh, so all we have to do is uh, pretend that Pleistocene men also preferred blondes. We don't know. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Just go with it. Um, and then we try to figure out, well, why is that? Why were blondes selected for during the Pleistocene? Let's just say it's because fair-skinned blondes show age and disease more easily. So uh, men can more easily tell with blondes whether or not they're young and fertile and healthy. Um, so that is an actual example that was made up by uh, V.S. Ramachandran, uh, who is awesome. He wrote a whole paper called Why Gentlemen Prefer Blondes that was a satire of evolutionary psychology. <laughs> and he got it published. <laughs> And I especially love this picture of him, because like, he, do, he don't give a fuck. <laughs> like, <laughs> don't give a fuck. He is the honey badger of scientists. <laughs> what? <laughs> so he was being satirical, but apparently some evolutionary psychologists took him seriously. Uh, maybe uh, you might have heard of one guy in particular, I didn't make this up. This isn't another one of my MS Paint masterpieces. <laughs> this is an actual screenshot of the Sun newspaper. Uh, this was an interview with evolutionary psychologist uh, Satoshi Kanazawa. Uh, hands, anybody? No? Yeah. Okay, Th those of you not raising your hands, just pat yourself on the back because, <laughs> yep, you have uh, escaped him until now. He's the worst, uh, but also a lot of fun to make fun of, so let's get at it. Um, <laughs> he actually does argue that uh, gentlemen prefer blondes uh, for the same reasons that uh, Ramachandran made up out of whole cloth. Uh, he goes on to even defend his theory uh, against possibly the most obvious criticism, which is the entire continent of Africa, <laughs> <laughs> where somehow humans managed to continue reproducing without the benefit of blondes. <laughs> And I swear I am not making this up. His argument is that in Africa, they don't need blondes to tell which women are young and healthy because they're all naked. <laughs> and I'm not done. <laughs> they're all naked, and so you can see how much uh, women's breasts sag. <laughs> And he goes on <laughs> to say that this is also why men prefer women with large breasts. <laughs> because if they're perky and large, she's young. <laughs> and if they're saggy, then she's old. <laughs> I am not making this up. Uh, note that in the graphic on the screen, uh, maybe you guys in the back can't read, in the lower right hand corner, it says, Men sexually harass women because they aren't sexist. <laughs> Not a typo. <laughs> Not a typo. Uh, Kanazawa, devoid of any actual research or data, uh, says that men harass men all of the time. So it's only fair that they also harass women. <laughs> and all you guys in the audience totally get this because you've all been at work and you've had your boss come up and slap you on the ass. And <laughs> rope your crotch and suggest giving him a blowjob might not hurt when it comes to raise time. You've all been there. It's only fair that he does that to the ladies too. <laughs> yep.
Yeah. So it's not unusual for evolutionary psychologists to make dumbass pronouncements about sex, uh, particularly why every kind of sex is natural for a man, uh, while women hate sex unless they're using it to get money or babies or cuddles, I don't know. Um, and now if you happen to be in a well-adjusted, uh, good relationship with another, uh, with a woman, uh, or if you happen to be a woman, you might be thinking, women don't hate sex. Uh, well, you're wrong. <laughs> Science has proven it. Um, <laughs> No, there are actually some evolutionary psychologists who will agree with you. Uh, for instance, uh, these two uh, who wrote a whole book called Why Women Have Sex. Now, if I had written this book, it would have been one page long. <laughs> it would have been just like, because it's fun. <laughs> That's it. Uh, but no, uh, these guys didn't stop there. Uh, they bravely uh, went and interviewed a thousand white middle-class women to figure it out. Why do you have sex? <laughs> and uh, so at least they, they believe that women do occasionally like to have sex. And uh, some of the reasons uh, were kind of interesting. These two um, researchers published a study uh, on this back in 2007, which I think is where they got this book from. Um, the actual study that they did, they asked both men and women why they had sex. And the top 25 answers uh, from each sex were practically identical. Um, so number one, I felt attracted to the person. Uh, numbers two and three, I wanted to uh, experience the physical pleasure and it feels good. Uh, so actually a lot of them were just variations on because it's fun. Um, <laughs> the interesting thing though is that I, I was curious whether these researchers wrote another book called Why Men Have Sex because that's what their, their study was for both. Um, but apparently, uh, only women are the mysterious creatures that need an entire book uh, for you to figure out why they like sex. Because when I, uh, I was on like Barnes and Noble's website or something, and I uh, searched for why men have sex, and all I got was this. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think tells you everything you need to know about how screwed up sex is in our culture, and particularly how we view sex. Uh, with men and with women. Um, so at least these uh, psychologists did actually ask women why they had sex. Uh, there have been other studies uh, where women didn't really seem to figure into it at all. Uh, this is a particularly uh, fun and horrific one. Uh, this is Gender Differences in Receptivity to Sexual Offers, published in 1989. Uh, there are a number of studies that are based on this idea that men appear to enjoy casual sex way more than women do. Uh, and women, of course, again, tend to only want sex when they get a husband out of it, or babies, or money. Uh, so they take this as a given, uh, and then they do studies like this, in which they set out to prove it as a fact, and then make up a story about how our Pleistocene era brains are somehow responsible for this. And in this particular study, a group of attractive young white people were sent out into the public to invite members of the opposite sex to go to bed with them on the spot. Like, let's go back to my apartment right now uh, and have sex. And the results, uh, across two studies, 69% and 75% of men accepted the offer, and no women did. <laughs> so obviously women hate sex. <laughs> Because evolutionary psychologists can apparently find no better way to approach potential mates in public, this study has been tried out multiple times. Uh, the study was replicated in 2005 by researchers in Austria, where they found that with slight differences in setting, uh, also with subjects' age, uh, their attractiveness, age differences, uh, they managed to get up to 6.1% of women to accept. Meanwhile, pretty much all of the men were still accepting. The study was redone again just last October in a paper called Effects of Solicitor Sex and Attractiveness on Re Receptivity to Sexual Offers of Field Study. Come up with sexier titles, you guys. <laughs> Here's a direct quote from the abstract of this study. An experiment was conducted in France in which male and female confederates of average versus high attractiveness approached potential partners of the opposite sex. 120 males, 120 females. And they asked them, will you come to my apartment to have a drink? or would you go to bed with me? The great majority of the men were willing to have a sexual liaison with a woman, especially when she was physically attractive. 
women were more disinclined to have a drink, and none but one accepted the male's sexual request. Such results confirm that men are apparently more eager for sexual activity than women are. So there you have it, done deal, everybody. <laughs> uh, that is quite the assured conclusion. Uh, this study proves beyond reasonable doubt men are more eager for sex. Uh, or there's something else going on. I don't know, again, not a scientist, just got a few guesses. Uh, one possible theory I have is that women in Western nations are constantly told that there are rapes waiting to happen. Uh, if we re wear revealing clothing, if we have too many drinks, if we do drugs, if we lead on strange men, and God forbid if we go to the apartment of a stranger, we're told that if something terrible happens, if someone rapes us, it's our fault. Uh, for instance, like earlier this year, uh, soccer star Chad Evans was convicted of drugging and raping a woman who had initially gone willingly to the hotel where he was staying with his teammate. Uh, this was the overwhelming response on Twitter. Uh, Chad Evans became a trending topic, and the comments were horrific, uh, calling her a slut, a whore, a tramp, um, saying that in a premiere in with two footballers after a night out expecting tiddlywinks and ruin a poor bloke's life, hashtag gold digger. Because you know how much money there is to be made in the false rape accusation game. Uh, this is what happens. This is what happens to women. So, I don't know, maybe women who are approached by a stranger on the street who invites them back to a, uh, his apartment, uh, maybe they have a number of reasons to turn him down, even if those women happen to be super horny. In fact, to me, the most surprising thing about this study, all these studies, is just how stupid the men are. <laughs> a stranger, a beautiful stranger, walks up to you on the street and says, let's go back to mine for sex, and you don't think it's a scam? <laughs> what is wrong with you? <laughs> so, so the nice thing, though, is that there are studies out there that can help tell us whether or not these women aren't hopping into bed with strangers due to a lack of sex drive or because of a weird social norm. Uh, for instance, one study looked at speed dating, and what they found was that in cases where they let the women make all of the decisions about who they got to talk to, uh, the women were much more likely to have uh, a lot more self-confidence, and they were much more likely to be very cocky and non-selective as the men. Uh, they were slutty. They were sluttier because they had the power. So it, also in a survey of 2,000 single women uh, aged 18 to 63, Researchers found 82% had agreed to at least one casual sexual encounter. And in a paper last year in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, researchers asked subjects how they viewed the people who were approaching others for sex in that 1989 study. And what they found was that women and men both agreed that the women proposers in the experiment were intelligent, successful, sexually skilled, much more so than the men who were walking up to women and asking for sex. And the researchers are thinking that that's because we see women as being normally passive and shy, and so we assume that a woman who is confidently asking for sex is really good at sex. <laughs> and we see men as being really pathetic if they have to just out and ask for sex. <laughs> and so we view men who do that as being terrible at sex. And so these researchers took the subjects and they asked them to imagine being propositioned by famous individuals, friends, or same gender individuals. And what the researchers found was that both men and women were more likely to agree to casual sex if they were offered a safe choice of a person who they suspected would be fun in bed. Which makes sense, right? <laughs> makes sense to me. Uh, this is hardly the first time, though, evolutionary psychologists have been completely baffled as to why people do or do not want to have sex. Uh, and with that, I want to briefly talk to you about ovulation. Uh, <laughs> did you all just have a flashback to like fifth grade health class? <laughs> uh, <laughs> for instance, there's a now famous study uh, that was done on strippers. Uh, what these researchers found, uh, what they, they said was that lap dancers make more money when they're ovulating. And there are a few problems with this study, just a couple. Uh, there were only 18 lap dancers uh, who were supposed to keep track of their menstrual cycles and their tips for two months. Uh, but 
only, uh, the, the lap dancers only reported on 27% of the days that they were supposed to. Uh, second of all, all of them were from the same club in the same city, uh, which means that if their cycles were anywhere close to being together, uh, then they are, would all be equally affected by, for instance, a GOP convention in town <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> Third of all, is it really that big of a mystery why your tips for dancing sexy might go down during a time of a month that this is happening inside you? <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm sorry, but when I have cramps and I'm gushing blood out of my vagina, I curl up in bed, I don't put on six inch heels, <laughs> start spinning around a pole. <laughs> like, I have mad respect for those ladies. <laughs> mad respect for getting any tips at all, ladies. Evolutionary psychologists are completely convinced that women give off some kind of clues that they're ready to reproduce. Uh, in 2007, they tried to find out if women walk more sexily while ovulating. The results were no. <laughs> and so their conclusion was that that must mean that women are trying to disguise their fertility <laughs> to deter unsuitable partners. <laughs> In 2010, research, research, researchers found that in a group of 38 men, uh, the men found that a woman that they interacted with, uh, they found that she was least attractive when, unbeknownst to them, she was ovulating. <laughs> That's when she was least attractive. Uh, so that was explained uh, as the men fooling themselves into thinking they weren't attracted to her <laughs> so that they could maintain relationships with their girlfriends. Uh, this was, according to the researchers, uh, because evolution would favor a man who could stay with a woman long enough to bear children, which goes against all the other evolutionary psychologists who just think that men are there to spread their magical seed and run off. Uh, in 2009, researchers wanted to know if women were more racist when they were ovulating. Because, like, they're running out of shit to study while women are ovulating. <laughs> And what they found was that women weren't explicitly more racist, but they might be implicitly more racist. And that study involved 77 white psychology students at one university and has never been replicated. So needless to say that when you're talking about a handful of white college students, it's not exactly groundbreaking to find out that one week of the month they're racist. <laughs> And then, of course, there's a recent article you might be aware of. Uh, you can't find it anymore. It's gone. Um, CNN pulled it because it was very embarrassing. It was about how women vote because of their hormones. <laughs> uh, when they're ovulating, they're more likely, uh, it's like single women ovulating are more likely to want to vote for liberals. And women who aren't ovulating or are in relationships are more likely to go conservative. Um, which made a lot of sense, actually, because I checked my cycle. <laughs> and it's weird, because I was going to vote for Mitt Romney, like, all the way up <laughs> until the election. And then I was like, ooh, ooh. <laughs> nope, it's Barack. It's Barack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and as you know, men don't have hormones, so... <laughs> they voted based on logic. <laughs> This is a great cartoon I found by Alexa, Alexandra uh, Petrie on the Washington Post. She, she, she's as good an artist as I am. She was illustrating the hormones making the voting decisions, um, <laughs> which I quite liked. Um, so yeah, it's just yet another study that uh, is there to show that women are these emotional, fragile beings, probably shouldn't be able to vote. Um, <laughs> and it's not the first time that an evolutionary psychologist has tried to support a shitty stereotype about women. Um, here's one of my favorites. Uh, this is a study <laughs> that shows that pink is a girl's color because women were Pleistocene gatherers who had to be able to tell when berries were ripe. And the study had graphs, and graphs are science, so it's true. 
Uh, I mean, the weird thing, of course, is that we do have a substantial amount of evidence to show that up until the 40s or so, pink was a boy's color and blue was a girl's color. Um, but they don't let facts get in the way. Um, also, you know, you would imagine that if we evolved uh, based on, you know, women have to go out and find the best berries, so they need to differentiate between pink. You'd think they would study whether or not women are more able to differentiate between shades of pink and not just like pink. <laughs> that doesn't actually make any sense. Um, and then the study itself disproves itself because part of it was done in China, and what they found in China was that men also prefer pink which isn't a surprise when you realize that red is a lucky color in China. Uh, so what they found was that color choice was actually a huge cultural, there was a huge cultural influence. Um, but that didn't stop the headlines, uh, you know, study proves girls like pink. Um, there are plenty of other stereotypes like that. Um, the idea that men don't cry, for instance, uh, up until the Enlightenment, it's completely cool for men to cry. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, it was seen as evidence of honesty and integrity. Uh, Odysseus, for instance, cried all the, all the way through the Odyssey, and he like murdered everybody who wanted to bang his wife. <laughs> everybody. <laughs> and then he cried, had a little, had a little cry about it. Uh, and then there's the idea that women's uh, natural places in the home, uh, prior to the 19th century, it was actually expected that men would retain an equal hand in raising children and helping out around the home. Uh, couples were partners who might have performed different tasks, but they had an equal hand in running uh, usually agricultural businesses and things like that and maintaining the family and home. Uh, and then when the Industrial Revolution came around, men started working the factories, leaving women at home to take care of everything else. And so now evolutionary psychologists, though, ignore all that and pretend that women's places in the home, and then they look for uh, reasons to scientifically support that. So it's all good to chuckle at the bad science, uh, but what is the harm in bad science that perpetuates stereotypes of men and women? I'm glad you asked. I mean, I'm glad I asked for you because you don't have a microphone. Um, Using bad science to keep women and minorities down is nothing new. Uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century, women in the U.S. were fighting for the right to vote. Uh, those who were against them weren't just arguing from the Bible, they were also arguing from the biology textbooks. Uh, and not much has changed in 100 years. Uh, in fact, uh, here's a quote from a frequent contributor to Fox News, maybe you've heard of it, uh, spoken just uh, a few months ago. I think that one of the greatest mistakes that America made was to allow women the opportunity to vote. We should have never turned this over to women, and these women are voting in the wrong people. They're voting in people who are evil, who agree with them, <laughs> <laughs> who are going to take us down this pathway of destruction. Uh, and this probably was the reason that they didn't allow women to vote when men were men, <laughs> because men in the good old days understood the nature of the woman. Uh, they were not afraid to deal with it, and they understood that you let them take over, this is what would happen. Wherever women are taking over, evil reigns. <sighs> Let's hear for evil! <laughs> so, there are a lot of ways that stereotypes screw us up. One is that it's, they're sometimes used as the basis to limit our own rights. Uh, it's also used to excuse predatory behavior, like men evolved to rape. Maybe you heard of that one. Newsflash was bullshit. Uh, but it was used as a sort of, well, you know, it's natural for men to rape. Therefore, we don't really need to look into ways that we can change our culture to stop men from raping. Uh, it's natural. Uh, and then there's this uh, idea of something called stereotype threat, which is really interesting. Uh, Studies show that when you remind a person of their negative stereotypes about themselves, people underperform in accordance with those stereotypes. For instance, researchers at the University of Padova gave women a math test, and half the women were told beforehand that men do better on the test, and half were told that men and women perform at exactly the same level. And all of the women were given a blank sheet of paper to write down their thoughts and feelings. And the women who were reminded of the stereotype that women are worse at math wrote down twice as many negative thoughts, like, these exercises are too difficult for me. And as the women took the test, uh, those in the stereotyped group scored at around 56%, and those in the control group scored 81%. And there have been study after study after study that shows that when we remind women that they're supposed to be bad at math, 
they do worse at math. Uh, what these studies suggest is that women are attempting to suppress their anxieties and their self-doubts, and that's only making those anxieties and self-doubts even worse. It's this really shitty feedback loop that I have <laughs> illustrated for you very clearly here. Uh, and it's not just women that stereotype threat affects. Uh, it affects all groups, minorities. It even affects white men. Everybody uh, is subject to stereotype threat. Uh, what's interesting is you don't even have to remind a woman that she's supposed to be bad at math in order for her math performance to suffer. In one study, women who watched commercials that showed women being stereotypically girly about fashion and cooking they avoided answering math questions on a GRE-like exam, and they actually changed their own career aspirations to more stereotypically female careers, while women who viewed neutral commercials and men who viewed either commercials showed no change at all. The really remarkable thing is what happened in one 2008 study on the highest performers in college math courses. All of the students were given a test that they were told was aimed at measuring their mathematical abilities. And that was meant to invoke stereotype threat, to remind the women that their mathematical abilities are supposed to be not as good as the men. But then half of the students were assured that despite that, the test has never shown any gender differences at all, which was meant to negate the stereotype threat. And as you might have guessed from what I've already told you, uh, the people who were in the second group performed way better than the women in the first group who were under stereotype threat. But here's the really interesting thing, is that those women in the second group who had had that stereotype threat removed, they performed far better than even their own usual test scores would have suggested that they did. And those women way outperformed all of the men in both groups. And what the researchers believe is that these women were operating their entire lives under stereotype threat and that, make, that made them have to work so much harder that when you remove the stereotype threat, they fire way ahead of even the men. So it's not just about equaling the men, they actually do better because they had to work so much harder to compensate for stereotype threat. Uh, so that's one way that stereotypes screw us over. Uh, another one, uh, one last one I'll talk about is that these stereotypes can lead to a sense of not belonging, including at events like this. Um, it can lead to lower interest in skeptical or secular or atheist events. Uh, for instance, researchers at Stanford University showed uh, STEM majors, uh, you know, the, the techie, science-y people, and engineering and math, uh, they, they showed STEM majors a video that advertised a STEM summer leadership program that Stanford was considering running. And the subjects were hooked up so that their heart rate and uh, their heart rate was being monitored and uh, also their skin conductance uh, in order to measure their reactions. Half the subjects saw a video that showed about 150 people with an even gender ratio throughout the video. The other half saw a video that showed 150 people with three men to every one woman, which more closely mirrors uh, actual STEM gender breakdowns. Uh, and what they found was that the women who saw the equal gender ad were at, just as interested in the program as the men who saw it, but the women, oh, and they, they, they reported that they strongly felt that they belonged at, in that program. Uh, but the women who watched the video with three men to every woman uh, showed much more stress and they expressed significantly less interest in attending, and they were much less agreeable to the idea that they belonged there. So we can think about that in terms of what happens when we have an event that has, say, nine white male speakers being advertised. Uh, unconsciously, we could be turning off a lot of women and minorities who just don't feel like they belong in a place like that. Um, but there is good news. There are ways that we can combat, combat this. Excuse me. Uh, one of those ways is by getting women up on stage, putting them, getting them into prominent uh, positions of leadership, uh, like uh, Lauren Lane, uh, who is very prominent and awesome. And I think that she's one of the, uh, like a really big reason why there are so many women in this audience today. Um, there, you can also uh, mitigate stereotype threat, which is really interesting. Um, studies show that women perform better on math tests when they first read about individual women who had succeeded in architecture, law, medicine, and invention, 
Women also performed better when the test was administered by a woman who they believed was a su successful mathematician. So role models, self-affirmation, reframing the task as something that women are traditionally good at, all of these are ways that we can reduce or even completely remove stereotype threat. And my favorite way to remove stereotype threat that is supported by several studies is just telling women about stereotype threat. Once they know about it, suddenly it's negated, which is awesome. And that's kind of why I'm telling you and why I hope you tell other people. Um, because we can actually make a, a difference and help women feel more uh, as though they belong in, in, in STEM fields and also at events like this, which I think is just really important. Um, so uh, here are a few resources for you if you're interested in, uh, in this sort of stuff, particularly in mocking evolutionary psychologists, which never gets old. Um, <laughs> Great book for you, Cordelia Fine's Delusions of Gender, goes over a ton of this stuff. Um, Greg Layden's blog, Amanda Marcotte, Ben Goldacre, uh, all of them cover a lot of the BS that evolutionary psychologists put out. Um, David J. Uh, Buller wrote a whole book on it called Adapting Minds. Uh, and of course, you can tune into Skeptic at skeptic.org, and uh, we cover a lot of this stuff as well. Uh, so I'm just going to end by saying that I may have succeeded, I don't know, I might have succeeded in convincing you that women did not in fact evolve to shop. Um, however, I have a lot of t-shirts here. <laughs> and so tomorrow I'm going to be in the room next door in the morning. <laughs> and I don't want to take the t-shirts home. So I just thought I'd end by showing you, this is one of the t-shirts we sell. I want to point out that it is pink, like berries. <laughs> if you purchase one, you don't have to do any of the math. I will do that for you. And also, this model is ovulating. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'll take questions if we, have to, if we have, do we have time for questions? Do we have some time for questions? Like couple, couple, two. I want to say that she's not ovulating in the picture. Uh, she's ovulating right now, <laughs> which was actually a really awkward phone conversation. <laughs> hey, Julia, I just want to know, are you ovulating? She's like, stop calling me. <laughs> it's, it's weird. So, so yeah, are there, are there any questions? I, no, I answered all of your questions preemptively. I'm that, I'm that awesome. You really, you don't have any? Any question? There's one. Is there any good evolutionary psych? Is there any good evolutionary psych? Probably. <laughs> I, I'm guessing yes, uh, but it's so boring <laughs> because you can only make it interesting if you make up everything. Uh, because really, like a good evolutionary psychology would be more like, well, we don't really know what happened in the Pleistocene, and we have no evidence <laughs> for this, but maybe this. It's not, it's not the sort of thing that makes headlines. Um, so if there is good evolutionary psychology, um, it's not in the media, and therefore it might as well not exist as far as uh, the general public is concerned. Uh, are there any evolutionary psychologists in the audience? I should have I led with that. OK, woo. <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah, then let's just, let's just go to the bar then. So we're good. All right, thank you so much, everybody.